Welcome everybody to London Futurist. My name's David Wood. We all know people whose lives are impacted by aging. Their bodies have become frail, their mobility has reduced, their mind has diminished, their recollection isn't as sharp as it used to be. At the same time, we also all know people, possibly even ourselves, whose lives have been impacted by smoking. After all, smoking makes us lose our breath and increases the likelihood of us dying from cancer by perhaps uh, 15 to 30 fold. So it's no surprise that often we want to tell each other and ourselves don't smoke. But if we are alarmed at the <clears throat> increase in probability of dying from cancer due to smoking by a factor of 15 to 30, what about the fact that as we age, our likelihood of dying from cancer goes up even more? Between the age of 20 and the age of 60, according to some statistics, our chance of dying from cancer goes up roughly a hundredfold. And if we live another 10 years to 80s or 90s, it could increase yet another tenfold, which makes a thousandfold increase overall. So if we want to give each other and ourselves the advice, don't smoke, we might also want to give each other the advice, don't age. But hey, what does that mean? Does that make any sense? After all, most people think that aging is something completely natural and inevitable. And so any such talk about slowing down or stopping aging is just foolish talk. Or is it? The speaker today, Dr. Andrew Steele, is going to bring us up to date with a lot of the insights of science about aging, the mechanisms involved. So aging is no longer just a topic for metaphysicians, for poets, for priests and gurus and mystics. It's a subject that science now has a lot of very constructive and informative things to say. So we're going to hand over now in a minute to Andrew Steele, whose background, by the way, is a PhD in physics, studying various things to do with magnetism and other complex interactions. Then he switched over to postdoctoral research in biology, in fact, in computational biology at the Francis Crick Institute and at King's College London. And that led him in to writing the book Ageless, which was the inspiration for me to ask Andrew if you'd like to come on board. So Andrew, over to you. Thank you, David. Um, yeah, I just thought I'd start by giving a short presentation to show you some of the ideas in the book, sort of set the scene, statistically speaking. Um, so here it is, the cover, oh sorry, here it is, the cover of my book. Um, and the reason I wanted to write this is that a lot of people, exactly as David said, think that aging is just a natural process. It's something that happens to all of us. And it's not all bad. You know, some of it's acquiring wisdom. It's getting experience, just moving through life and you know, life happening. But I think that when you look at this as a biologist, aging is the greatest humanitarian challenge of our time. And I want to unpack that a bit and explain why I think that and hope to convince you of the same thing, too. The other fact is that aging, as we now understand it, is slowable, even reversible in the lab in dozens and dozens of different ways. So this, you know, this goes from being a potentially quite depressing topic, this enormous humanitarian challenge, to one that we can genuinely do something about. We've got the tools in science, the tools of technology to start to think about doing that, not just in lab animals, but in humans as well. And that combination, I think, makes it the most exciting, probably the most important area of current scientific research. And yet, in spite of that huge excitement and importance, it's a spectacularly neglected area of science as well. So I just really want to try and raise the profile of this field of study. And I think that by treating the aging process itself, rather than treating the individual diseases, David in the introduction mentioned cancer, but obviously there are loads of other ones as well. Rather than treating those diseases individually, we could come up with preventative medicines that could potentially defer or even entirely prevent all of these diseases or many of them at once. And I think that means that this has the possibility to be the greatest revolution in medicine since the discovery of antibiotics. So I thought I'd start out with the graph that changed my career. Uh, as, as was mentioned, I started out as a physicist, then took this sort of U-turn into biology. And the reason I did that was fundamentally because some statistics expressed graphically. So let me show you um, what, what caused this. It's a surprisingly simple graph. It's one that has on the bottom how old you are, and then up the side, it's your probability of death in that year. And of course, all of us know that old people are more likely to die than younger people, but exactly how much really shocked me. So let's stick that line on there. Wow. So let's, let's go through that and sort of talk, break it down and see what it means. In your first year of life, you've got something like a half a percent chance of dying. That's because you could be born with a congenital problem or a genetic problem or, you know, very unfortunately, a type of cancer. And that means you've got about a half a percent chance in the rich world of not making your first birthday. 
However, if you're lucky enough to make it uh, through that first year of life, things keep on getting better and better and better and until they gradually reach a sort of optimal level of uh, not dying around the age of 10. And current 10 year olds have an incredible title. They are the safest humans in the entire history of our human species. They've got a chance of less than one in 10,000 of not making their 11th birthday. But unfortunately, everything's downhill or rather on this graph uphill from there. So that means if you're 18, you've got about a one in 3000 chance of dying that year. If you make it into your thirties, your chance of death is somewhere around one in a thousand. And um, from that point onwards, something rather unfortunate happens. Your chance of death doubles every seven or eight years. And that means that you're effectively having exponential growth in the rate at which you're likely to die, the rate at which you're aging. And as we've all seen this year with the corona, or indeed last year with the coronavirus, exponential growth can mean that something starts out looking small and innocuous, but can eventually become very big very quickly. So if you make it to 65, you've got about a 1% chance of dying that year. But if you make it to 80, you've got a 1 in 20 chance of not making your 81st birthday. And right the way up there at the very top of the graph, off, you know, off the top of this screen, if you were to make it into your 90s, your odds of not making your next birthday are somewhere in the region of one in six, a sort of survival at the roll of a dice. So that's really quite a terrifying exponential thing that all of us have got to look forward to as you grow older. And so as a human, as I say, this is sort of quite terrifying. You know, this, is, this is our mortality um, rendered into this statistical artifact. But as a scientist, if you can sort of remove your human terror for a moment, there's something quite fascinating about this. What it shows us is that there's some huge um, exponential, you know, this huge exponential increase in death must be happening for some reason. It sort of suggests there's a coordinated process that's orchestrating this incredible and sudden increase in our chance of dying. So the question is, what's going on? What is aging? And David mentioned a bit of this in his introduction, but um, just to sort of go through the various aspects of the aging process. First, we've got the obvious cosmetic ones, the things like the wrinkles and grey hair that are very obvious from the exterior, but aren't necessarily um, actually, you know, they're not going to kill you. However, they are reflective of the processes that are going on inside your body. Um, there's actually a fascinating study that was done in 2009 where people were asked to rate photographs of others and guess how old they were. And they found that how old they looked was a pretty good predictor of how soon they were going to die or how soon they were going to contract diseases, even if you um, compensated for how old you actually, you know, you knew them to be based on their birth certificate. So clearly what's going on on the exterior is somehow reflective of what's happening inside our bodies. However, as well as these sort of cosmetic signs, there's also the, the real scary stuff, the diseases, the cancer, the heart disease, the strokes, the dementia. And those are just obviously the top few. There are loads and loads of different diseases that become exponentially more likely with age. And ultimately, you know, this is what goes on to kill you. Then there are things that are sort of losses. I've grouped these all together. Vision loss, muscle loss, hearing loss, uh, memory loss. And what all of these really mean, although they're losses of a particular you know, physio physiological feature or ability, they really mean a loss of independence. They mean things that you used to be able to do yourself, you know, you used to be able to get around the house and you know, do all your everyday chores on your own. Suddenly this becomes much, much more difficult as you get older because you lose all these various different abilities. And that can be anything from infuriating to incredibly socially isolating. You know, if you're at a family dinner table and you can't hear what's going on, it's very, very difficult to get involved. And then finally, there's the stuff that isn't directly aging related, but is nonetheless exacerbated by the aging process, things like infections and injuries. So if you imagine you're know, getting flu as a young person, if you're in your 20s and you get a bout of flu, it might mean a week in bed, it might mean you know, a huge number of tissues and paracetamol, but ultimately you're just going to recover and be right as rain a week later. Whereas if you get flu in your 80s, you could end up going into hospital, you could contract a secondary pneumonia, and you could be dead a week later. So it's just the case that because we've got so much less so-called reserve, because basically all of our organs are failing in a variety of different ways as we get into older age, um, these insults that would be, you know, you basically brush off as a young adult, you can then end up, you know, dicing with death basically when you get older. So I'm going to return to uh, this, this career changing graph of mine. Instead of looking at chance of death per year, I'd like to look at the chance of some of those diseases that I mentioned. So let's have a look at cancer, heart disease, stroke, dementia. And what you can see with all of them is that they're, you know, they're, they're, they don't all happen at exactly the same time, but they do all r dramatically ramp up as you get later in life. And dementia is a particularly um, striking example of this. Unless you've got a particular genetic um, a genetic change that predisposes you to dementia very early in life, then it's basically unheard of in people by the age of 50. And yet after the age of 60 or so, your risk of dementia doubles every five years. So it doubles more rapidly than the risk of death itself. And it's the combination of these various things. You know, this fundamentally is why you die. There's a sort of pervasive myth that you can die of old age. You just sort of become ever more frail and ever more wrinkly. And then one day just sort of disappear off, slip into the night and you know, go, go to bed one night and don't wake up the next morning. But actually, you know, 
that basically never happens. You're almost always dying of some disease that's been you know, dragging on for years and years. If you think about cancer, you have your chemotherapy, you have your operation, and then you, know, you get a metastasis or the cancer comes back. Uh, heart disease can slowly sap your ability to move, um, you know, to get around, to do exercise, to play with your grandkids. And then eventually, you know, finally, these things get severe enough to take your life. Just another example, this horrible uh, mucousy green color <laughs> represents chest infections. And again, this is something that, um, it does happen in you. You know, you can see there's about a two percent chance, even when you're at your lowest um, possibility of getting one of these chest infections. But again, they're much, much more um, common in older people, and again, much, much more deadly. You know, most of these people in the lower part who are going to get a chest infection will shrug it off. You know, with a week or two, or you know, maybe a course of antibiotics or something. Whereas an older person, again, it's very much a risk on whether they're going to make it into the next year. So what I'd normally do at this point, quite apart from returning to this graph again, is, um, is have a little quiz about global life expectancy. Now, that's obviously a bit harder to do over Zoom, but what I'd like you to do is just, um, just imagine for a moment, what do you think, where do you think most people in the world or most countries in the world fall on this graph in terms of how long people are expected to live? So what do you think is the global average life expectancy? Well, the most recent figure I've got is this. It's from 2019 and it's 72.6 years. And I think this comes as a surprise to a lot of people, because if you do surveys, what you find is that almost everybody can guess 10, maybe even 20 years below what's actually the case. Because I think what a lot of us were taught in school is that there's a, um, there's a huge developing or third world that's um, very poor people. They've got very low life expectancy, very poor sanitation, very you know, high death rates, basically. And so we imagine that there's this huge section of the global population that are dying very young. And therefore, that global life expectancy can't possibly be this high. And, you know, on the one hand, this is incredibly good news because it means that people around the world are living longer and healthier lives than ever before. But on the other side of the coin, it means that most people in most countries are living long enough to make it a fair way up this graph. They're living long enough, basically, to be susceptible to the problems of ageing. And that means that this isn't just a problem that we in the rich world are sort of, quote unquote, lucky enough to have. Uh, you know, we, don't, we aren't just fortunate enough to live long enough to suffer from these horrible diseases. This really is something that is increasingly problematic throughout the world, and it's only becoming more so as the global population ages. So what this all means is that if you look at the 150,000 people who die every day on planet Earth, because so many people in so many countries are living long enough to suffer the effects of aging, then over 100,000 of those deaths are because of the aging process. To put that another way, aging kills more than twice as many people as every other cause of death combined. So that means that, you know, if you're worrying about uh, what's, what's killing people, aging is clearly way out ahead. And this is why I think it's the world's greatest humanitarian challenge, because it doesn't just kill people. I've already gone into detail about, you know, how it slowly causes degeneration over years or decades beforehand. You're getting more frail, you're losing your hearing, you're losing your memory. And these diseases, they don't just knock you out instantaneously. They, they're drawn out over years and years. So this, what this really represents is billions of people suffering for years or decades. And that's why I think this is unarguably the biggest humanitarian challenge of our time. So this is the last time we're going to go back to this graph, I promise. But what I want to do is now look at this and say, you know, what can we do? We've already said that as a scientist, this suggests there's some kind of underlying process. But how can we change the fact that humans risk of death doubles every seven or eight years? Is it even plausible? Well, what I want to show you is this little chap. This is what's called a hydra. It's a very simple freshwater organism. They're about a centimeter long. So this is a microscope picture. And they first came to the attention of science because they've got incredible regenerative capacities. If you chop basically any bit off one of these hydra, then you'll end up with two hydra, the hydra you started with and the little piece you chopped off will grow into a whole new hydra. So that's why scientists were first fascinated by them. But they noticed as they kept them uh, alive in you know, test tubes in the lab, these things just weren't dying. And in fact, they have a property called negligible senescence. And what that means is that they have a risk of death that doesn't seem to change with time. And in Hydra, this is spectacularly low. So this is the equivalent line for a Hydra. It's about 0.2% is their risk of death per year. And so if we extrapolate that out, obviously we haven't done the experiment. We haven't watched these Hydra for sufficiently long to be totally sure that something doesn't happen very late in their lives. But if they carry on with this risk of death, they could potentially, you know, 10% of them could still be alive after a thousand years. So they're clearly experiencing aging in a very different way to human beings. And you might be thinking, well, you know, this is a weird little freshwater creature. It's, you know, not got that many cells in it. It's nothing like a human, really. But actually, there are quite a few different creatures who experience negligible senescence. Uh, obviously, my favorite is this one. This is the Galapagos tortoise. And we think the longest recorded lifespan is somewhere in the sort of 170, 180 year range. And this is the Galapagos tortoise, in fact, from the front of my book. So that's the reason that these tortoises are on the front of the book. And again, what's exciting about these isn't that they live a long time, because you could sort of argue, oh, you know, they're cold blooded, they've got a very slow metabolism, they, I mean, they just look pretty slow, don't they, these things, they don't zoom around very, very quickly during their lives. So it might just be that they live slower, that, you know, they have effectively the same amount of um, 
the same amount of time as humans from a biological perspective, but just sort of drawn out over a longer period. But what's really interesting about these tortoises is that their risk of death does stay constant. It seems to be, once they get become adults, somewhere in the region of one or 2% a year. And that means that a few of them are lucky to live these incredibly long lifespans. And then, you know, tortoises, again, they're still relatively distant relatives. This is another of my favorite, probably negligibly senescent organisms. This one is a mammal. Um, you might be thinking that's a penis with teeth. It's actually a naked mole rat. These are tiny little rodents. They're relatives of rats and mice. And in spite of the fact that these things are, you know, similar sort of size to rats and mice, which can live, you know, two or three years if you keep them coddled in the lab, this chap can live about 30 years. And again, this negligible senescence means that A, their risk of death isn't changing very much as they get older, but B, they're not becoming more frail. They're still you know, scurrying around just as quickly. They're still able to reproduce until very late in life. The reason uh, this guy looks so wrinkly is actually just a, an artifact of where they live. They live in these little underground burrows and having very baggy skin allows them to squeeze past one another in tiny tunnels. So you know, the irony is they look incredibly old throughout their entire lives, but in fact, they live this incredibly long time, much, much longer than closely related species. And they also seem to be resistant to a number of age-related diseases. In fact, we, we, we thought these things literally couldn't get cancer until just a few years ago when, you know, finally we'd studied enough of them to spot the very, very occasional tumours that they get. So these animals clearly have something in their biology that makes them very different from animals like mice and perhaps animals like humans. So maybe we can learn something from the biology of these long-lived and more importantly negligibly senescent animals and try and apply that to people too. So back to this slide here, we said what is aging and we listed all these different things. Um, but what I've done here, I, you know, I wanna tell you this, this slide's obviously a bit of a lie because I've listed you know, a handful of things here. There's actually thousands of items that should be on this slide. Just, you know, think about cancer. There are hundreds of different types of cancer, hundreds of different organs it can occur in. And we now know that if you get like breast cancer, for example, you can do genome sequencing of those cancers. And there are hundreds of different types of breast cancer with different mechanisms that have allowed them to proliferate, you know, allowed these cells to divide indefinitely. So it really isn't the case that, you know, these are single diseases and that you can tackle them um, one at a time. Because if you want to try and, you know, cure cancer, which is something that we sometimes say, you know, say we're aiming to do, then actually what you're looking at is curing hundreds of individual diseases, perhaps even, you know, a, a disease that's entirely personalized to the individual who's diagnosed with it. And the same is true of all these different things. Heart disease obviously covers a load of different things. There are different types of stroke. You can lose your memory or your hearing for a variety of different underlying biological reasons. So fundamentally, it's a, I, I think it's something of a lost cause to try and defeat every single individual one of these problems individually. So what can we do? Well, the good news is that the answer to the question, what is aging, has been dramatically overturned in the last sort of 10 or 20 years. And these are the 10 so-called hallmarks of aging that I talk about in my book. Now, some of you might be familiar with the 2013 paper by the same name, the hallmarks of aging. It's only got nine of these things. I ended up, I think, combining two and adding another one of my own. So I ended up with an extra one overall. Um, as you can see, this, this basically follows the same prescription. And these are the fundamental underlying causes of all those different aspects of the aging process that I was just discussing. So, you know, you think about um, cancer, that's partly caused by DNA damage, it's partly caused by the loss of um, function of our immune system being unable to find those cancerous cells. And there are a whole load of other things on here that you could sort of attribute cancer to. But the same is true of everything, you know, frailty uh, is caused by loss of muscle, which is caused by you know, a combination of these different things on here. Wrinkles, grey hair, all of them, you know, the underlying causes are basically some combination of these things. And what's most exciting is that we've got ideas that I go into in the book to treat every single one of these. And the idea then would be that we could slow or reverse an individual cause of aging. And that would then mean that we could slow or reverse the aging process as a whole. You know, everything from wrinkles and grey hair to cancer to heart disease to cataracts. So what I thought I'd do is give an example. I'd, I'd tell you about what I think is probably the most exciting and sort of near term prospect in terms of treating a hallmark of aging, just as an example, because obviously otherwise I'd be here uh, for the rest of the afternoon, the rest of the evening even. So I'm gonna talk a bit about the uh, senescent cells. And so first of all, we have gotta talk about what senescent cells are. Well, senescent cells are, um, the, the, they were first discovered in the 1960s by a guy called Leonard Hayflick. And what he was doing was studying cells in a dish in the lab. And he noticed that after those cells had divided a certain number of times, it was about 50 in the case of the cells he was looking at, they would just stop dividing. And not only did they stop dividing, but they looked really weird. Um, even to my relatively untrained eye when it comes to microscopy, you can really see these cells, they're sort of a bizarre shape. They look totally different to the younger non-senescent cells that preceded them. So that led to the question, you know, if these cells themselves can age, could it be the case that the aging of the individual cells inside our bodies is one of the things that causes our bodies as a whole to get older? And what we found in the intervening few decades is that, yes, that is the case. Um, all kinds of different creatures accumulate these senescent cells as we get older. And unfortunately, you know, these aren't just benign elders of the cellular community. They actually accelerate the aging process itself. 
So let's think about why that happens. Firstly, let's think about why they're formed. Well, we've already seen that they can happen when a cell divides too many times. And that's something that can obviously take place. You know, if you're, um, if you think about various parts of your body, you think about your skin, you think about the lining of your guts, you think about your blood cells. These are places where your body is constantly renewing. It means that new cells are dividing in order to take the place of the old ones. You know, as you lose skin, some of the dust around your house is your old dead skin cells. That's a lovely thought. And your guts, you know, that's a particularly rough environment for a cell. It's a place where there's lots of toxins from your food. There's bacteria. There's all sorts of stuff going on. So your body's basically decided rather than make these, you know, build these cells like tanks and make them invincible. It's just going to carry on refreshing them to make sure they stay, uh, stay youthful or stay useful, I should say, really. The problem is that as these cells carry on dividing, then that can mean that they eventually turn senescent that way. It's called, it's called replicative senescence because they've just divided too many times. We also now know there are various other reasons that a cell can become senescent. So you can get too much damage to your DNA or too many mutations, for example. And if a cell detects it's got sort of a worrying level of DNA damage and mutations inside it, it'll basically slam on the brakes. And the reason for that, we think, is it's a cancer defense mechanism. Because we know that the way that a cell becomes cancerous is it accrues a certain combination of mutations, which allows the cell to divide indefinitely, which can eventually make a tumor, which can eventually you know, spread throughout your body and kill you. So the idea is that senescence then just sticks on the brakes and stops that happening. And we also know that uh, there are various other mechanisms by which a cell can become senescent. They can just be stressed, basically. They can be in a biological environment that's not very pleasant, not very amenable to uh, you know, getting on with life. And again, just to be on the safe side, they'll often stop themselves dividing at that point to make sure that nothing bad happens. So what a senescent cell will do next, it successfully stopped dividing, but that isn't enough. It's obviously it's still there, not doing its job. And so it starts pumping out a combination of molecules, which are known as the SASP, the senescence associated secretory phenotype. Um, that sounds very complicated. Senescence associated obviously just means it's a thing senescent cells do. Secretory, because they secrete them. And phenotype just means a sort of behavior, basically. So um, the senescent cells can be identified by this combination of molecules that they secrete. And the purpose of these molecules, the sort of reason that they're there, is that they're trying to attract the attention of the immune system. These cells are saying, help, help, I'm old, you know, I'm damaged, I've divided too many times, can you come and clear me up? And when you're a young person, that's exactly what happens. Your immune system will come in and, you know, one of your immune cells will gobble up the senescent cell and it'll be you know, problem solved. A new cell can divide to take its place. Unfortunately, as you get older, we've already talked about all the mechanisms by which a senescent cell can form. Well, you're going to have more cells that are divided more times. You're going to have more DNA damage. You're going to have more cells in a stressful environment of the older body. And what that means is that those cells um, are more likely to become senescent. You also have the problem that for a variety of different reasons, and one of them, in fact, ironically, is cellular senescence, the immune system becomes less effective at its job. So it's less able to you know, swing by and clear these cells up on time. And what that means is that these cells gradually accumulate. And the problem is that those molecules in the SASP, they're very good for attracting the attention of the immune system, but they also drive a process called inflammation. Now, inflammation is a perfectly natural process in young people, um, as long as it's what's called acute inflammation. So say you get a cut or say you get a you know, viral or bacterial infection. What happens is that cells near the site of that problem will emit these inflammatory molecules. And again, it's basically calling the immune system over and saying, help, there's a problem here. I, you know, I need you to come and sort this out. And that means the immune system can zoom in and these cells can basically you know, start the healing process or start clearing up all of the um, bacterial or viral invaders. So that's how it should work. And the idea is then that once the problem's gone away, the inflammatory response dies away you know, relatively quickly. The problem is that in old age, this inflammatory response can get dialed up for various different reasons. And you enter a state called chronic inflammation. And this isn't usually like as, as, as big a response as acute inflammation, but it's just a constant fizzing and buzzing. It's sort of, you know, distracting the immune system, making it a little bit paranoid, constantly looking over its shoulder, expecting some threat that's never quite going to materialize. And so this SASP, because it's made of these inflammatory molecules, can, uh, you know, can exacerbate this chronic inflammation. And so basically, therefore, it accelerates aging. So we've got these cells that accumulate as, they, as we get older. We've got a plausible mechanism by which they can make aging worse. The real clincher as to whether they're actually uh, you know, directly involved in aging is whether we can remove them and improve the situation. And the good news is that we can. If you give mice drugs that remove the senescent cells from their bodies, it basically makes them biologically younger. So there was an experiment done about five years ago now where some mice were given a combination of drugs called desatinib, which is a chemotherapy drug, and quercetin, which is just a, a, a sort of flavanol. It's often found in fruit and veg and sometimes used as a supplement. Um, if you mix those two things together, it turns out that that's particularly effective at killing senescent cells, but leaving regular um, non-senescent cells unharmed. And so they gave this cocktail to mice. The mice were about 24 months old, which is about 70 in human years, because uh, obviously mice live a lot shorter time than we do. And what they found was that firstly, the mice lived longer, which I guess is, a, you know, that's a good thing. That's the first thing you're looking for. But these mice weren't living longer in geriatric ill health. They weren't sort of stumbling along, unable to die. They were basically living more youthful for longer. So that, you know, they got less cancer. They got fewer cataracts. They got uh, improved heart function. 
They've also noticed that they can run further and faster on a little mousy treadmill. And um, it even gave the mice better fur, <laughs> which I think is something all of us can aspire to as we get older. So it really shows you that these senescent cells are a root cause of a huge, maybe even all of the aging processes driven by the accumulation of these cells. This isn't to say that's the only cause behind it, but they're certainly capable of this sort of global acceleration. And by getting rid of them, this global slowing or reversal of aging, um, which suggests that, you know, th th this basically is, um, a poster child, a really cool example of how removing one of the hallmarks or dealing with one of the hallmarks can then have this huge, huge effect on the rest of our aging, aging physiology, you know, across the whole different, all the different swathe of things. And the thing that's most exciting about analytics is that these results in the lab are so compelling that they're already in human trials. And at first, these human trials are going to be for particular conditions that are um, we think senescent cells are related or, you know, driving. So things like arthritis, which is the swelling, the inflammation of joints you get as you get older. There's a trial for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is a fibrotic lung disease that, again, commonly afflicts older people. There's another trial, I think, for age-related macular degeneration, which is a, uh, the most common form of blindness in older people. And what we can hope is that if these trials are successful, if these um, drugs can be shown to be safe, they can be shown to be effective, then it might not be too long before we can start taking these same prescriptions, these same treatments. Um, not because we've got a particular age-related disease that we know is driven by senescence, but just because we're on, you know, you're older, just because you're 50 or you're 60, so you've accumulated enough senescent cells in your system that it might be worth clearing them out to try and improve your health. So I think you know, we could be seeing these things in the clinic for specific uh, indications, specific diseases, perhaps even in the next few years if everything goes smoothly. And then if that all goes smoothly, it might only be you know, five or 10 years time before we could imagine prescribing these things preventatively. So I mentioned that I think therefore, you know, senescent cells, they're, they're, they're in many ways the poster child for this thing. They show you that by intervening in a single one of these hallmarks, you can have a vast effect on all different aspects of the aging process. And I think in terms of treatments that address the hallmarks, senolytics, the drugs that kill these senescent cells are likely to be one of the first, that, um, that, or probably like to be the first that enter the clinic. And obviously, as I said, we've got ideas for treating all of these different things. And the hope is that by treating, you know, one or several, or maybe even all of these hallmarks, we can slow down the aging process globally. We currently don't know exactly which of these are the most important and we don't know how all of them interact because, you know, it turns out that, uh, you know, for example, improving the health of telomeres, which is one of these hallmarks, also improves the health of mitochondria. And then if you improve the health of the mitochondria, that also improves the health of the telomeres. So this, this thing is clearly a you know, heavily interconnected network because biology is complicated. But it really gives us some hope that by you know, tackling one or more of these, we're going to be able to slow down the whole of the aging process. And you know, I can't promise that if we can tackle all of these, we can cure aging on our first go. But I think we'd, be, uh, you know, we'd make a pretty good attempt by the time we've tried that. So that's the sort of how, the can we cure aging? I think the answer is probably yes. I, you know, not, I'm going to be a terrible scientist, not put any hard timescales on this. But um, I also thought I'd ask the question just briefly, should we cure aging? And this is a a sort of strange thing that you find when you when you start talking to people about the fact that you're you know, you're working on a book on aging or you know perhaps you're an aging researcher you find that you get a lot of questions at the end of talks that aren't the sort of questions that other scientists get at the end of talks so you know say you're a scientist working on cancer research and you give a talk about um you know some incredible new uh, immune therapy that's going to potentially allow us to cure a load of cancers nobody sticks their hand up at the end and says excuse me uh, dr Steele, do you think that this you know, this incredible uh, new treatment for cancer is going to dramatically extend lifespans and therefore cause us to you know be facing down overpopulation or when well, all those people have been cured of cancer get bored with these uh, you know with all the extra years that you're granting them and yet when you give a talk on aging research that's often the first thing that jumps to people's minds and in fact you know if you go to a wedding or a dinner party and tell people this is what you do if you remember those days when we went to weddings and dinner parties the first thing that would always happen is someone would say to me not you know oh, what's the you know incredible biology behind these developments they'd say what about overpopulation that is definitely the first question that always springs to people's minds um but what i think is that actually treating aging is exactly from a moral perspective equivalent to treating all these individual diseases all at once the only difference is that you know it's treating them all at the same time rather than picking them off individually and i really can't see why it's not effectively the ultimate extension of what we want to achieve with medical research and i think the the case for treating aging as a, a as a medical condition with medicine is basically completely watertight and i thought in order to illustrate that um, i just wanted to give an example of one thing that uh, as i said the most common question you get is the case for over the case for what you know what we're going to do about overpopulation where are we going to put all these old people who are now living these longer healthier lives I'd like to tackle that in two ways. The first way is that I'm going to show you a graph of what's actually going to happen to the population potentially if we do something about it. And the second is to sort of equip you with a general purpose answer, which, which I think applies to every single one of these moral objections. So let's start with a specific case of a quote unquote overpopulation. 
So we've got a graph here, obviously we've got the year along the bottom, we've got the population of the world up the side, and you can see that you know, the story until now has, uh, has looked something like this. The global population has been increasing. It passed 6 billion in 1999. It was 7 billion in 2011. We're sort of coming on up for 8 billion people now. So clearly the population is continuing to expand. And the question is what's gonna happen, happen to it over the next few decades. So if you go and ask the UN, this is their most likely best guess. This is called the medium variant. And uh, what that suggests is the population is going to carry on going up. It's going to slightly slow down as, um, as birth rates around the world reduce. But basically, by 2050, we're looking at something like 9.7 billion people. Now, in order to try and get a handle on this, I, I'm not an expert at population modeling, so I couldn't like, go in and tinker with every single parameter. I thought, let's try something really, really simple. Let's try the most ridiculous scenario. Um, let's imagine we don't just cure aging, we cure death in 2025. So literally nobody dies after the year 2025. This is what happens to the population. So what you can see is the population does go up, but it only goes up by a surprisingly small amount, I think. So it goes up from the 9.7 billion that we would have estimated just based on current trends to about 11.6 billion. And that's, again, if literally nobody died, you know, starting in four years time now, um, which I think, you know, even the most optimistic uh, longevity scientists would say is probably somewhat of, somewhat of an optimistic projection. Um, so what this means, yeah, this in many ways, this is if you're a population pessimist, this is the worst case scenario because this is going to result in the largest uh, growth of population that you could possibly anticipate. And yet it's only going to result actually in a 20% difference in our population. Now, I'd like to take issue with the very word overpopulation because I think the problem is it suggests that the people are the problem when actually it's our resource use. That's the real issue. Um, you know, if you have people who consume a huge amount, we emit loads of carbon dioxide, require a load of land to grow our food and so on and so on, then that's ultimately what's causing the pollution, what's, you know, draining the natural resources of our planet and actually if you look at the, uh, the the people who are using those resources it's us in the rich world the richest billion or so people on planet earth are emitting something like half of the carbon dioxide depending on how you count it so that means there are six or seven billion people who are emitting that other half and i think that you know our aim as a civilization should be to bring all of those people in the poorer parts of the world up to a you know quote unquote western standard of living up to the same standard of living that we enjoy in the west and so we're going to have to find a way to dramatically reduce the carbon footprint, the land footprint, the resource footprint of doing that, just in order to get the people who are currently living in less well-off parts of the world up to our standards of living. And that is without any population growth at all. We're still going to have to come up with a way to you know, dramatically reduce our footprint on the planet. So I think making it 20% harder, just obviously it's not nothing, but equally you have to look at the other side of the equation. You're going to be curing the single largest cause of death and suffering. Um, you know, it kills twice as many people as everything else put together and all these decades of suffering before that for billions and billions of people. I would definitely work 20% harder to solve these environmental problems if it meant that we could have this huge sort of moral counterweight on the other side of that argument, because it would just be perhaps humanity's single greatest achievement. So, and that, that, that's, as I said, that's the worst case scenario if you're a population pessimist, because we're unlikely to cure death in 2025, it's actually probably going to be less than 20% harder. So I really don't think this is a case for not doing something about aging. And the final point to make on this sort of specifics, that's the medium variant that the UN has. They also have a low and a high variant, and those aren't changed by changing life expectancy. They think that's, you know, they think they've nailed that prediction, which is sort of surprising. But if you vary the birth rate, you can see that you get this error bar on here, basically. And what that means is that just by changing the birth rate a bit, you can make a significant difference to the population. So, you know, death isn't the only thing that can have, have an influence on how many people there are on planet Earth. We can also affect it by changing the number of people who are born as well. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about was this general argument, which is that whether you're talking about population, whether you're talking about undying dictators, whether you're talking about what won't, you know, only rich people have access first, I think it's really important to remember, again, as I sort of alluded to, what it is that's on the other side of this equation. And the way that I like to do that is to reverse the question. So imagine, let's take the case of overpopulation. Imagine we're living on a planet and there are 20 billion people, but it's a population where aging doesn't exist. People don't age to death. We're a negligibly senescent species. And so people are living, you know, long, long time, maybe even hundreds of years in perfectly good health. Would you, in, the, in you know, looking at that, thinking, oh God, you know, we're using all these resources, the planet is being decimated. Is the lever that you would reach for to try and solve this problem, to invent aging? I really don't think that it is. Like the first things you'd try would be trying to reduce your resource use and your land use. You'd try and, try and make your civilization more efficient. If you ultimately you know, tried all of those things and there was literally no other way other than to kill people, and I would really argue that you should try absolutely everything before you go to that option of last resort, would you really do it by causing them to deteriorate over decades? You know, potentially get dementia, forget the names of all their friends, their relatives, forget their entire personality. Would you have them suffering slowly, you know, losing their ability to get around the house, losing their ability to do things, losing their ability to play 
with their relatives and friends. Um, I just don't think that's the approach that you'd take. I don't think there's any moral argument to which the answer, if aging didn't already exist, would be to invent aging and therefore to switch it around. I think there's nothing, uh, you know, there's no moral argument that you can come up with is of sufficient weight to override the fact that, you know, aging has these huge wide ranging benefits. So I just wanted to, oh, hang on, that's not right. I just wanted to pop back to my slides um, and have one final look at the reason that I really wanted to, um, the reason I wanted to write this book fundamentally, the reason I want to try and get this message out there as much as possible. And that's because aging research is dramatically underfunded compared to the scale of the problem. And this is, you know, even before we consider any of the humanitarian stuff that I've been uh, you know, banging on about for the last uh, 20 minutes or so, then we've also got the economic cost of aging. And these are some figures that I pulled up for the US that the cost of uh, my, my favorite, favorite is probably the wrong word for these particular diseases, my favorite for age related diseases, cancer, heart disease, stroke and dementia. And the annual cost of these diseases is absolutely gigantic. It's hundreds of billions of pounds. When you consider there are other things that aging causes other than these four diseases, it's pretty clear that the cost of aging to the US economy is in the, you know, is over a trillion dollars. And, um, you know, that's, that's not that surprising when you think about the US healthcare budget is about $4 trillion. So, you know, a, a huge fraction of that is dealing with the chronic diseases of aging. And these numbers don't just include the healthcare; they also include the indirect costs. So that's things like people giving up work because they're no longer well enough to, to do their job, or perhaps people giving up work to look after an elderly friend or relative. Um, and so that, again, has this huge sort of knock on effect on the economy. So you think you're looking at this thinking, oh, you know, it costs over a trillion dollars a year. How much is the U.S. investing in trying to solve the problem? Well, the US is one of the few countries in the world where you can actually um, answer that relatively directly. They have a, a research institute called the National Institute for Aging, NIA, and its budget is about $2.7 billion. Now, just to put that into context, that little square isn't just a, a bullet point almost, it is actually a, a square that, whose area is in proportional to the amount that's invested. So what that means is you can see how many of those squares would fit into that giant uh, you know, sea of costs from age-related diseases. And actually, it's worse than that even suggests, because there's a joke in the uh, aging science community that NIA doesn't stand for National Institute for Aging, but actually stands for National Institute for Alzheimer's. And that's because over half of the NIA budget actually goes into the NIA neuroscience division, which is basically you know, going to studying dementia. It's obviously a very important goal, but it's not looking at the aging process as a whole. It's looking at one very particular aspect of it. There's then other divisions in the NIA that study things like social gerontology, or they look at um, you know, how to care for older people in hospitals. Again, really important questions. But if you drill down to the aging biology section, then that has about, well, about $300 million is the total budget. And then again, you have to split that further. And it's, it's not very easy to do this because it's, you, have to, you, know, you have to go in huge, huge detail through the reports of the grants that they file. But a lot of what the aging biology division does it's fundamental aging biology, it's basic research, it's understanding the aging process. Now, obviously that's absolutely crucial. It's basic research, it's, it's you know, understanding of aging that gets us to the position where we can actually do something to, about it, where we, can, where we can learn to treat it. But the problem is, that means that if you're looking at how much the US is spending you know, on public funding of actually trying to treat these age-related diseases, it's substantially less even than that. It's probably somewhere in the region of a 10,000th of the cost of aging to the economy. And it's very hard to be accurate with that figure for all the various reasons I've just suggested, but it just means that the money that we're spending on trying to treat the single largest cause of human suffering is woefully out of proportion, even to its economic impact, let alone to the humanitarian one. So as I said, fundamentally, that's why I wrote this book. I wanna show voters that this is a really important thing. I just want you know, normal people to engage in the idea that treating aging is a thing. It's an important thing. It's, as I said, probably the most important bit of science of our time. I want policymakers to understand that so they'll fund this research. I even want scientists to read this book because what I found was as I was working as a biologist, I'd been sort of dragged into biology by this moral imperative having seen the huge toll of aging. But when I spoke to my colleagues about aging, I found that you know, even if they had great degrees from great universities in biology, they often hadn't even had a lecture course or hadn't seen a textbook or even a chapter in a textbook that was relating to aging biology. And the same is true of doctors. My wife is a doctor. And again, in your medical undergrad, you don't study aging other than to say, you know, these patients are very complicated. They have lots and lots of different uh, drugs that they need to be taking. You sort of understand their social care and the context in which that happens, all of which is very important, but fundamentally means that very, very few people, whether they're biologists, whether they're medics, even people who should know about this stuff, understand the significance of these results in aging science. So that's why I wrote this. That's why I'm giving this talk. And that's why I'll continue to talk to anyone who'll listen uh, about this topic. And uh, thank you very much. I think we've got time for some questions. That was uh, really super, Andrew. Uh, you've you. kept our audience engaged, so much engaged that contrary to usual, 
there's been very little written into the chat or the Q&A because people are obviously hanging on your every word. But I now do invite audience members, if there's something that you particularly want to see questioned, uh, put the questions into the window you'll find at the bottom. It's called Q&A. Uh, ideally, make it a short question. You're more likely to have people read and vote for your question. And yes, indeed, you can vote for each other's questions by putting your mouse over the thumb and clicking it up. And by the way, if you change your mind afterwards, if you thought that was a good question, and then later, wow, that's a very good question, you can uh, change your mind. But we'll try and cover quite a few of these questions along the way. So Andrew, you got this uh, tortoise on your cover, and you suggest them as an example of a creature that doesn't have a growing senescence. Is there actually a research into why the tortoises uh, manage to overcome the growth and hallmarks of aging? Or are there other people researching other negligibly senescent creatures, possibly some sharks or whales or indeed the naked mole rats? How much of the research is going in that direction? There is some, but it's not as much as you'd hope. And I, I, have, I have mixed feelings about this research some, to some extent, because the fact is that, you know, to take a tortoise as an example, its biology is radically different from ours. As I mentioned, you know, it's cold-blooded. It's, it's not in, in anything like the same sort of group of animals as we are. But nonetheless, it would be really interesting to sort of have a firmer answer for that question, because I can sort of answer from an evolutionary perspective why a tortoise might evolve to be negligibly senescent, whereas we might not. But I think, uh, yeah, in, in terms of research into the fundamentals, there has been some work looking at, for example, how many times a tortoise's cells divide before going senescent. I think a Galapagos tortoise's cells can divide about 120 times before going senescent, which is obviously more than a human cells can. So maybe that's one of the mechanisms, but it's not entirely clear what's going on. There's some very good work being done by a guy called uh, JP de Magalhaes in Liverpool, collecting together lots and lots of genomes of organisms that are very long lived. And I think perhaps maybe more exciting than Galapagos tortoises is elephants and bowhead whales, I think both of which, I think certainly the bowhead whale genome was sequenced by his group because they're incredibly long lived. You know, these whales, I think the, the longest lived bowhead whale that was found in the wild was estimated to be 211 years old. And one of the biggest mysteries, or literally the biggest mysteries about them, they're, they're enormous animals. They can weigh, I think about hundred tons. So clearly, you know, they're, they're hundreds of humans in weight. And the cells of a bowhead whale are actually about the same size as the cells of a human. And yet, even though these animals live for centuries, and this is in the wild, you know, humans in the wild might live for you know, 40, 50, 60 years at the outside. Um, these, these whales are living you know, maybe three or four times longer than a wild human. They've got far, far more cells, and yet they aren't riddled with cancer. Because you might think every single cell is an opportunity for a cancer to arise. Cancer is basically a, you know, a game of bad luck. And if your cells are unlucky enough to accumulate the right combination of mutations, then that cell will start dividing and you know, eventually divide enough times to become a tumor. And yet a bowhead whale, in spite of being much bigger, having much longer for that cancer to arise, appears not to do so. And so, yeah, look, looking into you know, what, what mechanisms they have to defend their DNA or what mechanisms they have to nip cells in the bud before they become cancerous, I think is potentially quite a fruitful area. Just another comment to the audience. Uh, I do prefer if people post questions in the Q&A window because uh, they can be voted for. So it's more of a group intelligence rather than me just happening to pick questions out. By all means, do erase other incidental points in the chat and we may pick some of these out as well. If you do chat, bear in mind that uh, Zoom by default will just send your comments to the panelists. That's to Andrew and me. If you want the group as a whole to see them, you've got to click this little thing at the bottom and say to all panelists and attendees. Having said that, let's take the question that has the most upvotes. It's by Jose Caldera. Uh, he gives his thanks to you for an excellent presentation, an excellent book. Uh, but he wants to ask you about something you said you didn't want to speak about, which was timescales. Mm. So when do you <laughs> think these treatments will be commercially available to most people? And he refers to somebody who was from the same university as him, MIT. That was Ray Kurzweil, who says that there's a good chance we will have good treatments for aging by 2045 at the latest. So are you willing to be tempted to discuss I'll have a go. I, I, as, as I say, I'm always, I'm always terribly sort of scientific and bet hedging in this regard. But I think it's the thing that I always say is I think it's going to happen within the lifetimes of many people alive today. And that's at once a massive bet hedge. And yet at the same time, sufficiently exciting i hope to encourage people that this is a really big deal and the reason that i say that is well let's think about a few specific examples i think the, the senolytics are a bit of a no-brainer they're going to happen soon and that's because we've got human trials going on you know barring it, 
for some reason being hugely important in the biology of mouse mice and utterly irrelevant in the biology of humans, then it should be the case that we can deploy some of these drugs. There are 20 or 30 companies that are currently working trying to make various, they're not all drugs, but various senolytic treatments that can remove these senescent cells. So it really does look like, you know, that's a growth area. I would be surprised if we didn't have a treatment for something based on senolytics within the next five years. And it's not at all inconceivable that, you know, five years after that, we could be seeing them, as I said before, so, you know, within 10 years being used for general age reversal. It's very hard to put your hand on your heart and it depends a bit on how regulators behave as well as how the science continues. Um, but that's certainly plausible. I think there are other things that might again happen in the, in the nearer term, things like um, dietary restriction memetics. So I, I don't think I mentioned that at all during that talk because it was quite a short version. But we know that if you feed animals dramatically less, they live quite significantly longer. And there, there are various drugs that are trying to mimic the effects of this dietary restriction, but without having the sort of tedious abstinence, the fact that you're feeling hungry all the time and the various other side effects you get from DR. And um, there's one called rapamycin, which does have a few side effects, but it's sort of slowly either it or these things called rapalogs, which are sort of drugs that are analogous, but not quite exactly the same that intervene and cause something a bit like DR. There's also a drug called metformin, which is a very common uh, diabetes drug that's being trialed. And that's actually going to, I think that trial should have started already, but it's been delayed due to COVID, unfortunately. But they noticed that people who are taking this diabetes drug, even though they had diabetes and were less healthy, therefore, than people who weren't taking it, they seem to live a bit longer. It seems to have some anti-cancer properties. So it'll be really interesting to see a proper trial where they just hand it out to people who are over 60 and see if they live longer. And if that works, that's a very cheap drug. It's already got a very well understood safety profile. We've been prescribing it in the UK since the 50s. You could well imagine that being rolled out, you know, within the next five years if that trial is successful. Um, beyond that, I talk in the book about stem cell therapy and gene therapy. And these things, you know, sometimes they sound like hopelessly futuristic, but actually we're making a huge amount of progress. You know, induced pluripotent stem cells, there was a lot of, and these are the stem cells that you can generate from anybody's uh, normal body cells. You can take a little biopsy, grab a few cells and turn them into these stem cells which you can then use to make any kind of cell that you need. And obviously there are lots of places in aging where you lose your cells and replacing them should you know, potentially be able to alleviate some of those problems. So iPSC therapy is hugely exciting. And that has really started to rev up in the last five years. I think if I'd written this book five years before, there would have been far fewer examples you could point to. There's, there, you know, there are big trials in age, you know, there's a, you know, a trial for age-related macular degeneration, this age-related blindness I mentioned. They've started using iPSCs for Parkinson's, I think, as well, alongside using other kinds of stem cells. And if, if there's just so much going on in this field, I really think that, you know, maybe it would be 10 or 20 years away rather than five or 10 years away. But again, if, unless you're already 80, then that could quite conceivably happen in your lifetime. And then toward the end of the book, I start talking about what I think a real cure for aging is going to look like. Um, and I talk about the idea of a systems biology model of aging, because I think even if we hit all 10 of those hallmarks I mentioned, I, I, I don't think that's going to cure aging. I think we're going to have to have an understanding of how they all link together and perhaps how other things link together. And the fact is that we are living through a computational and a data revolution in biology. Um, we're at a point where you, know, you can sequence a genome for a thousand dollars in an afternoon or maybe even less money now. Um, so you can get, you know, someone's entire genetic code. We're getting to the point where you can do that in individual cells. You can read all the proteins out there inside an individual cell. And we're also getting these enormous machine learning models that can like pull together all this information in incredible ways that are you know, just beyond the understanding of humans. So if you think about uh, this alpha fold, the, the, the deep mind attempt to solve the pro protein folding problem, it's made a huge, huge stride in that field that had been um, you know, advancing very, very gradually, gradually for years and years. And suddenly there's this enormous, you know, this enormous change of pace just because machine learning has got involved. And I started thinking about these systems biology models and thinking, oh, this again, I'm, I'm starting to sort of talk myself into being a, 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 an incredible futurist. You know, I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be these huge models doing these inconceivably complicated calculations on these ludicrous quantities of data. This is surely something that's in the 23rd century. But then I thought, you know, hang on. If you think about, let's go back 50 or 60 years, we only just discovered the structure of DNA. And now 50 years later, as I said, we can sequence an entire human's genome for, you know, an amount that a lot of us in the rich world could afford in an afternoon. Um, if you look at the progress in computing over that same period of time, it's just absolutely phenomenal. Um, so I think it would be really unwise to bet that over the next 50 years, you wouldn't be able to have some similar, you know, have a similar level of advances, although we don't know exactly what that's going to look like. And then you think, well, you know, say you're in your 30s, and I, I don't wish to make this entirely self-centered, but I am in my 30s, so I'm trying to do the calculations for myself. You think, well, in 50 years time, I very much hope I'll still be alive. Because you know, life expectancy today in the UK is about 80, which means I, you know, even on average, would expect to be more than alive by that point. And then if I keep myself in reasonably good health and you know, eat well, exercise, do all the sort of standard stuff that we know about. And then if you know, by the time I'm 60, you know, say in 25 or 30 years' time, there's certainly going to be a point where 
you know, I, I think we'll know, we'll know some good senolytics. We'll know if metformin works or not at a very minimum. We might have some other more advanced treatments that I've talked about in the book. And that means I'll live a little bit longer in better health and a little bit longer in better health and so on. And that means because I'm living longer, there's more time for more treatments to be developed. And I think this is such a crucial idea because um, the fact is it makes curing aging, as I talk about in the book, so much easier. And that isn't to say that we'll have aging cured within the lifetimes of people alive today. But what it means is that, you know, if you can live, if you can live a decently long time, then you can live a little bit longer thanks to some more developments in aging biology. You might live long enough to be the, you know, get the fruits of the first systems medicine. And so I'm not going to guarantee to, you know, to everyone, <laughs> everyone watching this that we're all going to live to 200. But equally, it's very hard to imagine that we couldn't make substantial advances in the you know, lifetimes of people who are alive today. And I think particularly if we can encourage policymakers to just put a bit more money into this field, then... <sighs> As I say, I'm going to be a terrible scientist and hedge my bets and not give any like hard numbers, but I just find it hard. And, you know, I find it impossible to believe we couldn't make some really serious progress. Thanks. So that was a question from Madrid. I'm next going to go off to Nevada. So we really have an international audience. Uh, thanks to COVID, I guess. We're doing many more of these <laughs> online. This is a question from Gennady Stolverov. So he asks, uh, how do you think the COVID pandemic has affected and will affect the degree of support and the amount of progress we make in anti-aging research. Will people be more motivated to solve the problem of aging because they see the damage aging creates in terms of vulnerability to infectious diseases? Or will the disruption to the economy and the infrastructure of society from the pandemic set back progress for many years? I think it's it's a very complicated question, but I hope, and what I'm trying to do actually, is to is to use COVID to show people something that I think they've often been blind to, because um, you know, aging is this problem that I think a lot of us are able to ignore, just because it's something that's been so ingrained in the human experience for so many you know thousands of years, or you know even millions of years. If you go back to the species that came before us, a lot of people ignore it just because it seems like a natural, inevitable process, and there's nothing we can do about it. And I think what's um, what one of the sort of it's horrible to say the benefits of coronavirus but you know the, one of the sort of upsides of it has been that it's shown us in in a way that you know we've, we've all been pouring over these statistics every day you look at the death numbers you look at the number of people infected and so on and it's really really obvious just how much worse this affects older people and it's for all the reasons that we've talked about you know the decline of the immune system the weakness of their organs in general meaning they're not less able to withstand an assault and so on and so on so i really hope that we can leverage that and say you know look there are, there are various ways that you can try and future-proof yourself against a, you know, the next pandemic. You know, you can get quicker vaccine platforms. We can come up with better surveillance to catch these diseases before they get big. But frankly, a really good defense against the next pandemic is going to be people with younger immune systems and people with younger bodies in general who are therefore more resilient and more able to deal with the infection. So I really hope that yeah, the anti-aging community can make that case. I think um, you're absolutely right that COVID is going to set us back um, I, I projected back in, well, it must be in April, I made a video about coronavirus and I, I thought that it's going to set back human progress by about a year. And I think that's probably, you know, I'd, I'd stand by that. I think, you know, things are still ticking on in the background, but it has really knocked our economies and knocked all the sort of networks of things for six. It's uh, certainly a lot of scientific uh, research. There have been things that have just had to be put on hold because they require people in person clinical trials or they require people to be physically in a lab. And so lots of stuff's been mothballed. Um, but I think the sort of the optimistic flip side of aging being such a small field is that if we could just get a, what, what is in absolute terms quite a small increase in its budget by sort of pointing to coronavirus as an example of why it matters so much, we could easily reverse that lost year. Um, so, yeah, it's just a question of really, really driving home the point, showing people that coronavirus isn't some you know, isn't just an external thing that's happened to us. It's also because of this thing with aging. And just actually to one, one more point I was going to make. Um, there are actually several of these anti-aging startup companies or anti-aging trials that have pivoted towards COVID as well. Um, so, for example, metformin, I think I, I'm, I'm not sure if there's actually been a trial of it, but there's certainly been talk of having a trial. Um, not to give it, you know, it's not that you'd get sick with COVID and they'd give you some metformin to try and help. I think by that point, it's probably too late. But you might try and give metformin to people in nursing homes and see if that, you know, give, gives them a sort of greater resilience to coronavirus if it does unfortunately hit them. So there's definitely... There's definitely an opportunity here, and I think it's really important that we, we try and make use of it. I saw Nur Barzilai, who's from the Albert Einstein College in New York, talking the other day about evidence. Uh, I don't think it's been published yet that uh, people who take metformin are less likely to be seriously impacted by COVID. And I think he was looking forward to seeing some of that research published. 
Yeah, I think there was a, there was a study in China um, where, and it was observational, so you've always got to be a bit careful because it's like, you know, what, what is the population of Chinese people who are taking metformin? But they noticed that there were fewer hospitalizations of diabetics on metformin, I think. Don't quote me on that because that might not be 100% right, but there's, def- there's some suggestive evidence out there, certainly. So I'd be really interested to see something a bit more solid. The thing about your talk that struck me most personally was that very small green box compared to all the other uh, boxes showing the scale of the economic damage from these diseases. And then you dug into it further and you made that green box even smaller in terms of uh, the amount of funding. Uh, So why is it like this? I mean, I saw a comment in chat from Alistair Hiddig. Is it just that the human race is stupid? You know, uh, what are the reasons why we are arguably misallocating our resources in such a flagrant way? It's something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about, because actually before I started working on the book, I was doing a lot of campaigning around science funding. And you find that this is this is universal. I, I think ageing is probably one of the most neglected areas of science in terms of the amount of money we put in versus the sort of benefit that we could hope to get out of it. But even if you look at um, something like cancer or something like heart disease research, you know, these are these are big areas of research compared to ageing. And yet in the UK, cancer kills about a third of us. And we spend less than £2.80 per person per year on public funded cancer research, which is just incredible. Like if there's a disease with a 30% chance of killing me, I want to spend more than three quid a year trying to sort out that problem. Um, and yet, exactly as you say, there's this absolutely terrible resource misallocation problem. I think the fundamental reason is that we never step back and try and assess all of these things in the round. Because, you know, if you think about most people's day-to-day lives, I've got a lot of sympathy with people who've never made that calculation. I sort of happened across it completely by accident while trying to work out, while trying to get an idea of what government spending was per capita. And obviously that's a sort of nerdy, weird thing to do. It's not the sort of thing most people do with their Friday night. But I um, I was doing some of these calculations with a friend. We, we, we happened across cancer research and we went, no, that can't be right. I must have you know carried the naught or something. And when we, we dug into it, these statistics are, were, were correct and you know shocking throughout the world of science. Um, so I really think that sort of the big picture problem is that people just don't, um, you know, if you think about your day to day concerns, you know, getting the kids to school, making sure you're you know, taking the car in for repair, et cetera, et cetera. There's just so much stuff on most people's plates. And then to stand back and you know, consider the abstractions of government budgets. It doesn't surprise me that most people haven't thought about this stuff. And that's why I really want to get the word out about it um, to talk about aging specifically. The reason that aging is I think such a small field within science is sort of this self-fulfilling recursive prophecy that's happened, which is that if you go back to say the 1950s, um, and we're just starting to develop these evolutionary theories of aging, what the evolutionary theories suggest, sort of cut a long story short, is that aging is probably some incredibly complicated combination of dozens, hundreds, maybe even thousands of genes all acting together in some phenomenal, you know, tangled network that's creating this impossible process. There was there were quite a lot of scientists who thought it was just a, a natural thermodynamic process of decay. So, you know, if you look at uh, machines that we build, if you don't maintain them, if you don't oil them, et cetera, et cetera, they will fall apart with time. And so, you know, why should biological machines be any different? Because at the end of the day, that's all we are. Um, and I think we finally got to the point in aging biology where we can we can completely cast those arguments aside. We've shown that you can use a single gene alteration in both worms. And in fact, there's even been one discovered in humans that can significantly extend lifespan. So that suggests this isn't some tangled network of, you know, obviously it is a, on some level a tangled network of thousands of genes, but there are interventions you can make that are tractable that we can, we can do in our, you know, as I say, I keep saying in our lifetimes that could make a difference. So I think that's, um, that's the first problem. But then that becomes a vicious circle because if you've got a small field and this is what I was talking about at the very end of my talk. You know, biologists, imagine you're an undergrad biologist. You never get a lecture on aging, aging biology, or maybe you get one if you're lucky. What are you going to do when you come to choose your PhD? Well, there are very few scientists working on aging. And I had this problem myself. I didn't actually directly work on aging when I was working as a biologist, apart from my, a short time at King's. And that's because there just aren't very many labs working on it. And so, you know, there aren't that many jobs to go around. So, so imagine you're, you're, you're an undergrad. You've got your, you think you're choosing your PhD. You had a really great cancer lecturer as an undergrad. You've got a load of opportunities in cancer research. That's what you, you know, that might be what you choose. And then, you know, you do your PhD, you come to the end of your PhD, you've got a few papers in cancer research. What are you going to do your postdoc in? Well, you know a lot about cancer. You've got a few papers to demonstrate a track record. You're going to do a postdoc in cancer research. When you come to start your own lab, you're going to probably continue on that same track. And research really does back this up. If you look at scientists' careers, they tend to stick within, you know, whatever they started out with. And that means that then when you're a professor and you go back and try and lecture your undergrads, then you're not going to tell them anything about aging either because you never learned anything along the way. And so you end up with this sort of vicious circle where small fields stay small and big fields stay big. And even scientists aren't aware of this sort of 
you know, by and large, aren't aware of these sort of numbers about funding. And so they, they don't step back and go, oh, you know, hang on, isn't it weird that we're spending, you know, tens or hundreds of times more on cancer than we are on aging? Um, so I think it's a, it's a combination of, uh, you know, like human foibles, social factors, um, vicious circles, there's all sorts of stuff going on. And the way to smash all of those things, I think, is just to, is just to raise awareness. Just to raise awareness, yeah. I mean, if I was to push you outside the world of science into the world of politics, if you want to get more public funding onto ageing, do you have uh, something you would say we shouldn't be spending so much money on X, Y, Z? Or do you just want to leave that question to politicians to struggle over? I think there's an extent to which that's a political question. There's an extent to which it's also a... it's. It's a real this, this sort of zero sum idea of government spending is quite quite corrosive when it comes to chatting about these things, because the fact is that science funding is a tiny, tiny fraction of an error on, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a rounding error on government spending, basically. We could triple the science budget and nobody would notice. You know, if you, if you look at the, the, the depths of the pockets the governments around the world seem to have when it comes to bailing out the economy because of coronavirus, they can find you know, trillions of pounds or dollars just down the back of the sofa by quantitative easing or by various, you know, putting, putting out more government loans. Um, we can currently, most countries in the West, borrow at negative interest rates. You know, so we're getting, a, the interest rates are low enough that inflation means that we're actually, that, you know, people are paying us to borrow. They're so desperate to find a safe place to put their money. And so, you know, while I'm not a, an expert in, in, in economics and, you know, th these arguments should ultimately come down to the politicians. I think that means that we've, we've got a lot more money than is often pretended. And it's not necessarily a case that, you know, we're going to have to cut back on schools or cut back on healthcare or cut back on potholes or whatever it is in order to fund more aging research. And the final point on that is that this is often seen as an, a sort of line item of government spending. And I think spending is the wrong word. You should see this as an investment because the fact is we've got this enormous economic cost of aging. And what we want to do is drive that cost down by you know, coming up with drugs that slow down this process and mean that people are able to be productive for longer and people are less of a strain on the healthcare system when they do eventually get ill. And that means that ultimately this is exactly the same as, you know, say, say you were to borrow to spend on aging research and, you know, people talk about the nation's credit card and stuff. Then it's exactly the same as a business borrowing to invest. You're saying, okay, I'm going to take some money out at this point and I'm going to get a loan. I'm going to put a load of money into researching aging. Then that's going to pay down huge, huge parts of the rest of my government spending in you know, you know, 20 or 30 or 50 years time. And that's going to more than pay for the interest on the loan, which as we discussed actually at the moment is negative anyway. So it just, I find it quite mind boggling. And I think there's a, there's a huge problem in political and particularly the economic discourse in the UK and much of the world at the moment. And again, it's just a question of explaining this stuff to people in order to try and make it seem more tangible. As it happens, I'm hoping to arrange a London Futurist meeting on something called modern monetary theory. Oh, There's yeah. a book come out that we shouldn't be so worried about deficits. Of course, mm. deficit spending has its risks, but the argument is that it's been overstated. Well, watch this space. Hopefully that will be arranged shortly. There are researchers who have uh, contacted me recently who said, can I advise them about uh, where they could, close to where they are, do more research on aging? And the answers have often been, well, I'm sorry, you have to move. And for various reasons, people are unable to move because they've got family commitments, uh, partners have got jobs. So what you're mentioning, that people feel pressured to switch their research away from aging, I've seen that in my own social media discussions. But do you think it might be possible for people to do more useful research without having to relocate, that taking advantage of this uh, online world, that more and more people could usefully research uh, from wherever they happen to be, rather than having to up sticks and go to uh, one of the small labs, such as the one you mentioned in Liverpool by Yao Pedro de Magales, where, where there is a significant uh, effort actually co-located? I really feel, and I always come back to this, that the problem is funding. And it's, I think it's the case that a lot of scientists, you know, if you look at biologists, they have a lot of the tools. You know, the fact is I managed to move from physics to biology, which is a ridiculous jump. But if you're a cancer researcher, you already know all about, you know, pathways inside the cell. You know, maybe you specialize in something that's very cancer specific. But the fact is you've got all the general knowledge, you've got the lab skills, you've got the tools. I think the, the way that I would try and incentivize this would be to petition government to have more money in aging research. Because one of the things that determines how scientists, you know, alloc allocate their time is what grants are available. And if there are grants available to try and, you know, encourage people to pivot, to do a little bit more, something that's a bit more aging related or, that, you, know, is, you know, use their existing skills to work on aging. I really think that's the way to try and grow the field, because I think that, you know, it's, although I sort of make the case that aging is something that's quite niche and people don't necessarily understand. I don't think it would take us that long to train up some of the incredible you know, experts in various different other kinds of biology and tra transfer some of those skills across. So I really think funding is the lever I'd try and pull to change that. 
I'll try and take some more questions from the audience. And there's lots of questions, and none of, not too many of them are standing out from the crowd. So again, I urge the audience to have a quick look up and down. So you'll have to multitask. You'll have to listen to Andrew and me talking and also have a quick look up and down there. But uh, that will help us use the available time best. So there's a question by JB Sodge as to what's the practicality of these tool uh, cures. Is it that we'll be vaccinated? Will we be taking pills? Will it be a one-off or will it be something we have to do on a regular basis? Uh, do you have a clear view of any of that? I think, I mean, the honest answer is we don't know because we've never tried any of this stuff in humans yet. I think it's actually probably going to be all of the above. And I think it's going to vary depending on sort of what stage you jump in on the anti-aging train. You could imagine with analytics, for example, I, I talk in the book about it's, you know, it might become a bit like going to the dentist or going to the optician, because the fact is these cells do accumulate over time. And so it might be, and I, you know, I don't want to put a duration on it, but you know, it might be every six months, it might be every year, it might be every five years. You'll go and see your synologist, if indeed that's what we'll call them. And they would you know, take a measurement of what different senescent cells are in different parts of your body. They might come up with a combination of drugs or treatments that will optimally get rid of the ones that you need to have got rid of. And you know, maybe you'd stay in for you know, a day or it might, it might be that you stay in for 15 minutes and they give you a quick treatment and send you home. Or it might be that you have to stay in for a day. We just don't know because uh, it depends entirely on how the practicalities come out. And I think as we get as we start to understand this stuff more, you could imagine some of it being like a vaccine in the sense that, you know, you could inject a gene into somebody and that gene would then go on, you know, removing at least some of their senescent cells over an extended period of time. Um, there are some things that are going to be drugs. I think um, I think there's sometimes a bit of a tendency in certain parts of the anti-aging world to be a bit sceptical of drugs just on the basis that they often they're quite nonspecific. You know, that they're these molecules and they can interact with loads and loads of different things inside your body. And they do have their disadvantages that they are, you know, in some sense, quite unquote, less specific than, say, a gene therapy. But the fact is, we know exactly what we're doing with drugs. You know, pharmaceutical companies have been have got these really well established drug development pipelines. We understand how to do trials for them. So I think some of this stuff is inevitably going to turn out to be, you know, what are called small molecules. So, you know, it might be pills that you pop. Um, but I think a lot of that's up in the air. And if you read the book, you'll really see that there's the, the diversity of treatments that we're discussing range, you know, ranges from the, you know, the thoroughly mundane popping a pill every day, something like metformin, which is like, you know, something that millions and millions of people already do to the, you know, as, as I kept saying, sort of sound incredibly futuristic, having all your, you know, stem cells swapped out or something, which isn't obviously something we're going to be doing next week, but it might be a much more sort of invasive, intensive procedure than just popping a pill. There's a question about uh, spices such as turmeric or other dietary supplements. So this is from an anonymous attendee. Turmeric is known as the golden spice in India, in part because of its believed uh, health properties. Are we being collectively blind uh, that we're not paying enough attention to some uh, uh, possible dietary supplements or uh, uh, foodstuffs? Are there possible uh, implications for telomeres, for example, from, uh, from this turmeric and others? I mean, do you take turmeric? Do you take metformin I, I, and so on? I don't, I don't take anything. And part of the reason is I'm fortunate enough to be young enough that I think I can just sit and wait. And I actually think that probably applies to a lot of people. Um, because if you think about metformin, this TAME trial is going to happen. And hopefully in the next five years, we all know one way or the other whether it works or not. Um, so to me, it just seems, you know, you might as well just wait for the results to come in. Um, when you think about things like supplements, there is work being done actually on turmeric. There's the, the active ingredient is thought to be something called curcumin. And I, I'm trying to remember what it was actually being examined for. I think it might be a prospective dietary restriction mimetic, which means it could have quite a broad effect on the aging process. Um, the thing that I would say is that probably these things aren't going to have a dramatic effect on your lifespan. Because if you, you know, if you imagine that turmeric were to, were to double how long people lived or something, then it would be fantastically obvious just from looking at parts of the world where a lot of turmeric is eaten and you know, they, they would have these incredible long, healthy lives. Um, so I think you know, we can't expect absolutely massive changes. But I certainly think that, you know, natural products are an incredible way to find molecules that interact with other molecules. You know, the, the way that rapamycin, this thing that I talked about, that's a you know, very, very well studied dietary restriction mimetic was found, is it was found in a bacterium, it was actually discovered on Easter Island, fascinatingly enough, in a soil sample. And um, this, this, it's effectively a chemical weapon that that bacterium uses to try and kill fungi. And of course, evolution has had, you know, millions, even perhaps billions of years to optimize these molecules to do the things that they do. And so I think it would be, you know, pretty stupid of us not to look around the natural world and try and find molecules that might be able to interface with things that we're interested in. And we might then go on to optimize them in the lab to make them, you know, work in the way that we need them to work slightly better. But it's definitely a very rich source of inspiration. Uh, are there drawbacks to some of the potential treatments? So a question from Phil Roberts. I'm not sure if it's a man or a woman, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, she thinks she's read somewhere that some uh, senescent cells are required and that it's not a good thing to get rid of all of them. Is that true? 
that is true yeah and it's 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 fascinating actually that they're, they're called senescent cells and in the talk i sort of explained the simplest possible um sort of history of them and senescent seems like a good name because they were discovered they were old cells divided lots of times they looked weird they, maybe they clapped out actually I don't think that is a very good name. And I think the senescence community has realized as they've learned more and more about these cells, they actually have a number of fascinating roles in the body. Um, one of the most important is wound healing. So if you get a cut, then what will happen is that some of the cells in that region will turn senescent. And this senescence associated secretory phenotype, all these molecules that they're giving out, actually, you know, they call the attention of the immune system. They actually start the healing process in other ways as well. So clearly they do have a function. And actually, I think there was a study done where mice had their senescent cells removed and then they were given a cut and they healed more slowly. But fortunately, what the scientists found was they were able to identify the, the particular component of the SASP that seemed to be responsible for this um, accelerated or rather decelerated healing in the case of the removed senescent cells. And they, I think, I can't remember if they actually formulated it into an ointment. They found some way of um, putting it back onto the mice effectively and speeding their wound healing back up again. And I think that's a cautionary tale, which is to say that, you know, we should be aware that all treatments have side effects. And, you know, the fact these senescent cells exist, evolution often does have sort of weird backdoor reasons why something that seems on first sight stupid is actually really beneficial. So we've got to be cautious. Um, there are areas in the body where you might not want to delete senescent cells. So you can get senescent neurons, for example, cells in your brain. And if they're a crucial part of encoding a memory or perhaps encoding a particular skill or you know, perhaps they're crucial for breathing or your heartbeat or something, you really don't want to be deleting those cells willy nilly. Perhaps you want to come up with some way of reversing whatever problem it was that had, that, you know, they caused them to go senescent. Um, but what fills me with a bit of optimism is that when you look at the studies where mice have had their senescent cells removed, what you find is that the side effects reported, well, there basically aren't any. And you've got to be a little bit careful and take that with a pinch of salt because scientists, when they, you know, when they report their big splash nature paper, they don't want to give every single caveat. They want to make it seem like a really cool result, right? So it's not as though they're necessarily going to be absolutely meticulous. And also, you know, just a far more prosaic reason, mice can't talk. If they've got a you know, sore knee or something, they've got some problem that's, you know, could be described in words, they're not going to be able to stick their hand up and tell the researchers they've got that problem. But the fact that the, you know, these things do seem to have this very global effect suggests to me that, you know, obviously we've got to be cautious, do the trials, make sure they are safe, keep an eye on people. But it might be that we just struck lucky. Um, and I, I guess, you know, that's going to apply to all of the future aging treatments. We're going to have to keep an eye on it. We're going to have to try and understand the rationale. We're going to have to track mice and then later people who are having these um, treatments given to them and make sure that there aren't any serious side effects. But hopefully, you know, if we get reasonably lucky, the first few, the benefits will outweigh the costs sufficiently that we can just go for it. There's a question from... Uh... Istanbul, I think, a uh, London futurist who is there for the time being. What's the response of the wider medical community to the kinds of ideas that you are uh, sharing? Are they becoming more receptive that, to the idea that aging should be targeted as the root cause of most diseases and disabilities? Well, to give a personal example, when I first, uh, when I just met my wife and started talking to her about this, she thought I was crazy. <laughs> and I think that's... Uh, She's a doctor, yes. She's a doctor, yes, exactly. Um, and she, I, I, I think the problem is they just aren't trained to, to see this stuff in this way. And obviously, and thankfully <laughs> for, for me and for her and for our relationship, I did manage to talk her around. And I think when you start to view the aging process in the way that I do view it, and, that, and, you know, and she now views it, you really just see its tendrils everywhere because you, know, you realize that whatever ward you're on, regardless of you know, the, spe the subspecialty within medicine, a huge number of your patients are old people. And the reason that they're older people is you know, uh, fundamentally because they get ill more often, but it also means they've got so many other things wrong with them that makes their care so much more complicated. And I think that, um, again, it's just, I, I know I keep coming back to this, but it's just a case of raising the profile and explaining how this aging thing works. Because you know, fundamentally, if you haven't been taught this stuff in medical school, and there's there's one argument there isn't a reason yet to teach this in medical school because my wife can't prescribe a drug that will slow somebody's aging i mean they, she couldn't do it legally let alone practically because we don't actually have anything that's been proved in humans yet um so you know there's an argument that we shouldn't be teaching our doctors about this stuff but the other side of the argument is i think that this is probably something that's going to happen in the next 10 or 20 years or at least begin to happen and so we should probably be equipping our doctors with the knowledge that they're going to you know later perhaps go to depend upon so I really do think it's just a case of, of raising the profile of this field and explaining what we mean by anti-aging, that this isn't some sort of crazy sci-fi idea. It actually is about you know, treating patients in ways that doctors are really quite used to. And I think that once that word gets out there, I mean, this, this book is again aimed at the medical community because I, I think it's really important that they get involved. Because I think that one th another thing that I found very beneficial of living with a doctor while writing this book 
is that you know sometimes it's tempting as a basic scientist to sort of you know you can end up on flights of fantasy quite easily um and doctors have this very grounded view of the world they treat these patients they know all the complexities all the sort of everyday boring problems obviously they aren't boring they're very important but, you know the, the sort of st practical stuff that you just wouldn't think of as someone you know sat in front of a computer you know <laughs> cataloging genomes so I think it's really, really important that we get the medical community involved. I don't think there's any fundamental reason that they are, you know, I don't think there's any hostility or any, um, any, you know, any, any sort of intellectual inability to grasp this problem. I think it's just a question of making them aware of it. Well, that leads us nicely on to the question, which is top of the pile currently, again by Jose Cordero. Uh, would it help if uh, aging was declared as a disease? Would that change people's minds? And would it Fantastic allow question. more drugs to be prescribed, for example? I, I really sidestep this question in the book. And the reason is I'm ambivalent. Um, so the argument, I, th I think the strongest argument against calling it a disease is that I don't want to tell everyone over, I don't know, the age of 50, the age of 60, you are diseased. There is, you know, <laughs> you're ill. There's something wrong with you. Um, because obviously that's not a particularly great PR move for the anti-aging movement, anti-aging field. Um, however, I'm a complete pragmatist when it comes to this stuff. I want to do whatever will allow us to make the most progress the most quickly. And um, there are attempts to try and get aging classified as a disease or get more widely recognised. It was added as a, a code in the International Classification of Diseases, which is the WHO's overarching um, attempt to catalogue everything that can go wrong with the human body, basically. And the reason that that sort of stuff is being pushed for is because currently it's very hard to get a drug approved if what it does is it slows down the ageing process. And that, you know, what, what, what regulators want is a drug that has a specific disease endpoint. They want to be able to say, this person has got this particular problem. You give them the drug and it makes them live longer or it reduces or removes that problem. Rather than this is something that we'd give to someone who, you know, the medical community would currently consider perhaps a healthy 60 year old. They've got nothing really wrong with them. They're just a bit wrinkly, a bit gray haired, a bit slower than they were 20 years before. But there's nothing, you know, actually wrong with them. So the argument then is, you know, we should call it a disease in order to allow that regulatory thing to happen. I'm not entirely certain that that's necessary on the basis that this trial, um, I, I talked about the metformin trial earlier, it's called TAME, targeting aging with metformin. And um, the reason that that trial is being done isn't necessarily because the people doing it expect metformin to be some incredible, you know, lifespan tripling anti-aging drug. In fact, they expect quite the opposite. They think it's probably going to be adding, you know, a few years to lifespan and making people a bit healthier at most. The thing that's exciting about that trial is that they've worked together with the FDA, which is the regulator in the US, and they've tried to do so to, to they, they basically said we want to do a trial we want to treat this as an anti-aging drug it's not against a specific disease and so what we're going to do is we're going to watch people for a few years and we're going to see if they get cancer see if they get heart disease see if they die and there's a few other age-related diseases in there as well and in that way they've developed a sort of framework for an anti-aging drug that doesn't require it to target a particular disease and so the plan is you know hopefully metformin will work and that would be really great because it'll be wonderful to have the first true anti-aging drug you know available for everybody to, to buy and to take but even if it doesn't work, what it's done is it's provided that framework. They've gone through the sort of hardware, they've done the groundwork for the, you know, the next analytic or the next drug that might be a little bit more exciting, might be more likely to have a bigger effect. And then, you know, we'll be seeking approval in a few years time. If anybody wants to know more about the status of TAME, there is a video that was released by the Foresight Institute a couple of months ago in which Nero Barzlai, the driver behind TAME, uh, answered questions a bit like this for an hour on TAME. And it's full of fascinating insight as to why it's been delayed and to what, as to why it's likely to accelerate. And he explains exactly how they persuaded the FDA to be amenable to this approach. And also he has explained that exactly as Andrew has mentioned, metformin is only the first of a whole series of uh, drugs that might go through that mechanism. Talking about some of the giants in this field, we talked about Nur Barzlai. There's David Sinclair, whose book came out uh, a bit more than a year ago now, uh, Lifespan. He also is trying to draw attention to this field, but he has a different uh, main theory that he advocates. He, and there's a question by Samantha Cansfield. What do you think about David Sinclair's information theory of aging, which I think just focuses mainly on one of the 10 of the hallmarks of aging you pointed out, the epigenetic uh, damage? Yeah, I think 
I think there's almost certainly something to it. I think the epigenetics is that, that, that so we can build these things called, called epigenetic clocks, which I'm sure uh, having read lifespan, you'll know, but just for the rest of the audience, I'll fill you in on. The idea is that on your DNA, um, your, your genetic code, there are all these tiny little chemical markers you know, positioned all, all over it. And what they're doing is they're telling your cells, oh, this bit of DNA is really important. Make sure you're producing a lot of whatever gene this D or whatever protein this DNA codes for. And this bit, on the other hand, you know, in this particular type of cell at this particular time, we don't need it. So we'll tuck it out of the way and leave it, leave it unused. And the idea is that as you age, your epigenetics gets more disordered. That's David Sinclair's sort of overarching theory. But not only does it get more disordered, there are certain systematic changes that happen as well. And by monitoring those systematic changes, we can actually um, look at the position of all these epigenetic marks and work out how old you are. And not just how old you are, but slightly more morbidly, we can work out how soon you're likely to die or how soon you're likely to get a particular age-related disease. And the fact that we can do this prediction suggests that there is some fundamental involvement of the epigenome in, um, in, in aging. And I think it probably is the case that we can reverse some aspects of aging by fixing epigenetics. Um, a lot of the work that he's been doing recently has been looking at this idea of cellular reprogramming, which is where you insert particular combinations of genes that, among other things, seem to sort of basically reorder the epigenetic marks all over the cells. And again, as, as I've said on, you know, about previous treatments, they basically make these cells biologically younger. The cells behave in ways that younger cells behave. They've tried it in uh, fully grown mice. And they found they can reverse the aging in those. They found that they can improve the regeneration. His latest paper looks at regeneration of the optic nerve, which is something that if you injure your optic nerve as an adult, it's basic, that's it. You know, there's nothing that's going to happen. Whereas if you injure it as, um, I, th I think you have to go all the way back to being in the womb to get to the point where the optic nerve can regenerate in any significant way. So it seems that, you know, they, they injured these adult mice, but then gave them these, um, these reprogramming genes. And it seemed to, you know, give them the, the, the ability to regenerate that optic nerve again. So that's all very exciting. In fact, I think it's the, it's simultaneously the craziest and yet most exciting thing that's happening in aging biology at the moment. Because it sort of feels like we've been handed a cheat code to cellular biology where we can just turn back time. Um, and I guess we'll just have to wait and see whether we can actually, whether we've got the knowledge in, you know, the, 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 in, in the 2020s to sort of turn that into some kind of treatment. So that's fascinating and very exciting. However, there are some things that I think are very clearly not influenced solely by epigenetics. And I think there are lots of examples you could go into, but I think the clearest is probably the changes to proteins that are outside of cells. There are all kinds of proteins that support our bodies. So if you think about collagen, something you've probably heard of, because it's a, often on the side of skin cream, um, making various dubious claims. But collagen is, is the fundamental scaffolding of a huge amount of our body. It holds together our skin, it holds together our arteries, it holds together uh, the cartilage in our joints. It's incredibly versatile. Its precise structure is really, really crucial to the way that it behaves to make sure it's got the right combination of stiffness and flexibility for the particular application that it's required for. And what we find is that as you get older, this collagen, um, so, so the first thing is it's not um, overturned in the same way as a lot of proteins. The proteins inside your cells can literally last for days, you know, and then they get replaced with a new protein. Whereas collagen, some of it, we think that there's a bit of controversy around this can last certainly years, but maybe even a lifetime. And what that means is because this collagen lasts so long, the collagen itself can age. It can get um, things like oxygen and sugar, very highly reactive molecules that are inside your body because your body needs those molecules to stay alive, can end up sticking to the collagen and changing its properties. And you know, that's one of the things that's behind why our skin wrinkles as we get older. And because all this action is basically happening entirely outside the cells and it's happening in proteins that are never turned over or you know, at least very, very infrequently turned over, they're very infrequently changed out for new ones. It doesn't seem massively plausible to me that by changing the epigenetics inside cells and reducing the age of the cells themselves, that will solve all of the problems of these proteins that are outside of them. I would very much like to be wrong, but I strongly suspect that, you know, although the epigenetic clock or on epigenetics generally might be a key hallmark, it might be a particularly important one, I don't think we know yet. It seems unlikely that it's going to mean that we can completely ignore my other nine. We just don't know how many interventions we're going to need because the relationships are still uh, uh, dimly understood. There's a mm. whole huge complex network of relationships. Yeah, and I think I, I, I sort of talk about 10 hallmarks of aging. It wouldn't surprise me if there was an 11th and a 12th and a 13th discovered over the next 10 years. And that isn't necessarily a showstopper. It might just mean that, you know, perhaps these are hallmarks that are less important in current human lifespans. And, yeah, they might affect us as we live a bit longer. But I think, yeah, you've got to remember this is contingent. It's a complicated network. We just have to wait and see. For example, you add something that Aubrey de Grey doesn't include, which is the aging of the immune system as a hallmark in its own right. Yeah, and I think it's, I mean, it's, there's, there's a sense in which it's somewhat arbitrary how you break these things down. Because one thing I, I talked about that 
it's, it's hard to remember what's in which, but so one of Aubrey's hallmarks is the aging of the immune system caused by things like cytomegalovirus, which is something that I do talk about, which is the idea that these chronic infections that we never quite get rid of can cause the immune system to misbehave in old age. I don't think that's mentioned by the hallmarks of aging paper, for example, but it's just, I think it, it comes down to the fact that there, is, there are so many things and you can categorize them in so many different ways. I think that you know a lot of the thrust of these ways of thinking about it are the same. You write in the beginning of your book about evolutionary theories of aging and that uh, people used to think that it's for the somehow the good of the species in a sense that uh, mm. aging takes place. So there's a top voted question is by Bradley Elliott. If we have negligible senescence, will we risk evolutionary stagnation? Is that something that might cause us to be fearful of uh, having people living agelessly indefinitely? I think this is a really fascinating question because one of the, um, I, I won't go into the sort of the theories of behind the evolution of aging, but one of them is that the reason that or a fundamental reason why animals have to die, not necessarily age, but they do have to die is because there needs to be some generational turnover because imagine there was any kind of change in your environment, you're optimized to one environment and it gets hotter or your prey animal becomes much less um, common or, you know, there are a huge number of different things that could happen then because you're genetically unchanging because you're living forever, you're not going to be able to adapt to that changing environment. And so it's far better to have some kids who differ in a few small random ways from your genetics and therefore can evolve and therefore can you know, carry on to perpetuate the species. As it happens, there are loads of other reasons from an evolutionary perspective why we do age. So it might be that that is just sort of a fortunate side effect of the fact that animals do tend to age and die. But if that is a problem, I'm not that worried about it for humans. The reason be, or the reason's twofold. The first is that I think we're already quite a long way past evolution in a sense. Because if you think about, you know, our conquest of infectious disease, and it's obviously not quite a perfect conquest, as we've all discovered to our cost in the last 12 months, but we have significantly reduced the burden of infectious disease on humanity. We've got vaccines, we've got antibiotics, we've got basic hygiene. All of these things mean that people who otherwise wouldn't be alive are alive now. And that has undoubtedly changed, you know, the, the sort of combination of genes that are available in the human gene, gene pool as a result of that. And I think that that's only going to continue as our technology gets more and more advanced, because if we start you know, treating these age related diseases, treating aging itself, then again, we're just going to you know, fundamentally move beyond the toolkit that our own genetics has given us. And so I'm not massively worried about the fact that we're going to be, you know, we might potentially slow our evolution down. And the second reason is that um, as well as the fact that we're sort of moving beyond evolution, naturally is probably the wrong word, we're, we're moving beyond evolution anyway. Um, the fact is that I, I don't see evolution as a particularly useful solution for humans because say we wanted humans to live longer in good health. And I think that's a reasonable um, thing to hope for. It might take us generations and generations of breeding together humans who lived a very long time. <laughs> I'm not sure that's a particularly palatable way, quite apart from the sort of eugenic ickiness of it. There's also the fact it would just take us, you know, tens of thousands of years to evolve out some, you know, small number of age related diseases. Whereas if we intervene now, I certainly don't think it's going to be centuries before we've uh, at least somewhat solved this problem. So I just think evolution, it's not all it's cracked up to be once you become a technological species. We can uh, take over from natural selection, nature red and tooth and claw with intelligent design. It's not going to be yeah. easy. It's going to be hard and challenging, but if we really put our intelligence to good use, uh, we can get the best of both worlds. Absolutely. Last question on funding for aging. We'll come back to that uh, very important one. This is by Roman Bauer. Do you think commercial funding into aging research will become more significant than government funding? After all, we've mentioned a few companies working on aging. Some of the largest companies in the world have got groups dedicated to aging, and uh, many of the world's richest people seem to be investing gradually. So... Are you happy that there's a commercially driven funding for aging? And do we still need to wake up politicians to divert funds in the way that you've been advocating? I am very happy that there's a sort of bustling longevity investment scene. I think that you know, there's no way that you can argue that isn't a good thing. Um, I think we still do need public funding of science, though. And the reason, particularly in the field of aging, is that there are some bets that are just too long at the moment. Like Senolytics, we've got this pretty solid understanding of their mechanism. We've got different candidates. We've got loads of different experiments underpinning to show that they work. But if you look at some of the sort of wilder stuff I talk about in the book, some of the you know, gene therapies and stem cell therapies, we're not yet at a point where I would be confident. I mean, certainly investing my money, I haven't got a huge amount of it. <laughs> but, you know, even perhaps as a billionaire, you might not be willing to sink 10 million or 100 million into the R&D that was necessary to get something to the point where you might discover no, it just doesn't work. So there's no point trying to commercialize this. And the thing that governments can really do is take these huge collective decisions where the fact is that 
you know, they, they can back a thousand projects and it might be that only three of them are successful, but they are so wildly successful that they pay for themselves and more than pay for themselves, more than pay for all the other projects. But the fact is that as a, you know, even as a billionaire, you might not have enough money that you can make a broad based enough bet on a wide range enough of uh, things. And especially, you know, you have to have them pay back in the next five or 10 years as a sort of invest, typical investor timeline. Governments can take the long view, they can take the broad view, and they can get this stuff to the point where people can invest in it. So I'm very pleased to see that investors are doing this stuff. And I think it's, it's also, it's, it's a really crucial sort of uh, community building and attitude changing thing to do as well. Because the, the fact is that once hopefully increased government funding does produce more results that then can be commercialized, we need to have you know, bigger and bigger players investing in this stuff. It needs to go mainstream in a whole variety of ways. So it's definitely not a bad thing, but I, I don't think, uh, you know, unless Calico, which is the in, <laughs> huge investment Google's made, but very, very secretively in aging biology, unless they're cracking a load of the basic mysteries of aging, I think we're going to need public and philanthropic funding for some time yet. Well, there's lots, lots more we could discuss. So we've gone through about 40% of the questions. So uh, but it's time to wind down. If people want to find out more about your work, obviously they can and they should, in my view, read your book. We've only touched on a small part of the fascinating uh, research that you collect together, as well as theories. Uh, I think you've got a YouTube channel as well, and uh, you're sharing more information, bringing things up to date, perhaps. Yeah, I'm trying to add, uh, especially some of the ethical discussion, which there wasn't quite so much room for in the book, I'm going to make a few videos about. And obviously, <laughs> things are changing so quickly, it's always always going to need to update those things. So yeah, YouTube's a good place to look, which is youtube.com slash Dr. Andrew Steele. So it's DR Andrew Steele. And I'm also on Twitter as Stato, which is S-T-A-T-T-O. So yeah, you can keep up with what I'm doing there. What does Stato mean? <laughs> I was christened it in school because I was particularly, I had a facility for statistics. Um, ah. And somehow that nickname stuck. And so when I signed up for Twitter, and obviously I was a 140 character limit back then, I went for the shortest name I could. And I haven't been called that by anyone other than my school friends for about the last 15 years. But it still lives on in various online identities. And your interest in statistics led you, I guess, in part into the interest in computational biology. You're treading the path that many other great physicists have forward when Schrodinger speculated about uh, life and then Francis Crick was a physicist who cracked the DNA. You're following in good footsteps. So I wish you all the best of success. Uh, Thank you very read much. about London Futurists. We have a meeting in a week's time when we're looking not at aging but at cancer. We're looking at uh, the work of somebody who I noticed uh, gave a commendation for your book, uh, Andrew. That's uh, Kat Arne. Her book is uh, Rebel Cell. I found it fascinating from a point of view of she looks at evolutionary theories of cancer and uh, more than you might expect. So I encourage people to sign up for that. In two weeks time, we've got something quite different. We're looking at the possibilities of changing humans, not by pills or by drugs, but by inserting chips inside our bodies. Scary stuff, but there's something that might allow us to pay by having a payment card inside our hands, for example. Uh, is that a good thing or a bad thing? What are the security implications? And is this the prelude to humans becoming more cyborgs or is it just a sensible commercial step forward? There'll be lots more meetings in due course. Thanks for signing up. And it remains for me to say thank you so much, Andrew, for writing this book, for writing it so clearly. I think there are many good books in this field, but I think yours uh, describes the science particularly clearly, not too verbosely and not too impenetrably, but uh, in a way that it doesn't uh, make any uh, bad shortcuts in my view either. So thank you so much for taking part in this London Futurist event. Thank you very much.